say in the first time, I guess, in the history, the long story history of our church and many, many others, uh, there's never been a time when the church has sat empty of worshipers, at least, for a period of three months. But that's what we've been undergoing uh, due to the coronavirus. <laughs> So many unknowns, even to the healthcare profession. 
But Father, so many are worried and concerned about staying well, not only for their own well-being, but for those that they are frequently around in their family who may be elderly or have other health concerns. So Father, we support everyone's decision. Uh, whatever that decision was, whether it was to make the effort to come out and be in your house or whether it was to stay at home and enjoy the fellowship uh, from the safety there uh, by our YouTube channel. We thank you for those who have tuned in using that media uh, for the past three months. We thank you for all the good comments that we received and how blessed they were to be able to participate in our worship at that time. Father, as we move forward, we pray against this disease. We pray, Father, that they would find a cure or a vaccine soon. We pray, Father, for our health care workers and those who are in uh, various modes of public safety and all that they're going through right now. Uh, Father, just keep them safe and you help calm our heads to prevail in all of these things. We thank you so much, Father, for being our God. And even when we're afraid and concerned, over the situations in our world, we know that you are still in control and that you still know what the future holds because we know you hold the future. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. For our scripture lessons this morning, here now God's word is found in the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 18, we'll read the first 15 verses. The Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Marmarek while he was sitting at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. When he saw them, he hurried from the entrance of his tent to meet them, and he bowed low to the ground. He said, If I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, do not pass your servant by. Let a little water be brought, and then you may all wash your feet and, walk and rest under this tree. Let me get you something to eat so you can be refreshed and then go on your way now that you have come to your servant. Very well, they answered. Do as you say. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah. Quick, he said, get three seahs of the finest flour and knead it and make some bread. Then he ran to the herd and selected a choice tender calf and gave it to the servant who hurried to prepare it. He then brought some curds and milk and the calf that had been prepared and set these before them. And while they ate, he stood near them under a tree. Where's your wife Sarah, they asked him. There in the tent, he said. Then one of them said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now Sarah was listening at the entrance to the tent, which was behind him. Abraham and Sarah were already very old, and Sarah was past the age of childbearing. So Sarah laughed to herself as she thought, After I am worn out and my Lord is old, will I now have this pleasure? Then the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, well, I really have a child now that I'm old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Sarah was afraid, so she lied and said, I did not laugh. But he said, yes, you did laugh. Then we're going to skip to verse 21 and pick up at verse number 1. Now the Lord was gracious to Sarah as he said, and the Lord did for Sarah what he promised. Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age. And at the very time God had promised him, Abraham gave him the name Isaac to the son Sarah bore him. When his son Isaac was eight days old, Abraham circumcised him as God commanded him. And Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Sarah said, God has brought me laughter and everyone who hears about this will laugh with me. And she added, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children, yet I have borne him a son in his old age? And then the reading from the book of Psalm 116, beginning at verse number 1, and then we're going to skip and read 10 through 17. I love the Lord, for he heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy. And picking up at verse 10, I trusted in the Lord when I said I'm greatly afflicted. In my alarm, I said everyone is a liar. What shall I return to the Lord for all his goodness to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful servants. Truly, I am your servant, Lord. I serve you just as my mother did. You freed me from my chains. I will sacrifice a thank offering to you and call on the name of the Lord. And now a reading from the book of Romans, chapter 5, verses 1 through 8. 
Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which now we stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. And perseverance produces character and character hope. And hope never puts us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please meditate with me on the hymn of prayer as I sing, He Leadeth Me. Number 545 in our hymn. Congregation 
uh, in its entirety for your continued faithfulness, even while we weren't meeting together. Uh, I was so encouraged. Uh, one Sunday after he had watched the service, Brother Jim called me and he said, uh, the money has just continued to come in like it always would without a blip. He said, we are sitting on X number of dollars in the bank. And he said, uh, what should we do? He said, I think we should make a donation where it might help the most. So made a few phone calls around to different ones and we were able to make a nice donation to uh, the Feeding uh, Second Harvest Food Bank and also to the Work City Rescue Mission. So thank you all for that. And let's now give God thanks uh, by having the doxology uh, in, in giving him thanks for putting it on our hearts to continue to support ministry during this time. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him.
And at the meal, he took the unleavened bread. That would be a simple item, would be an ever Passover too. But he gave a special meaning when he said, This is my body. He to remember the me. Also on that night, in the upper room, Jesus took the cup, and he blessed it, and he passed it to his disciples, saying, This is my blood, which is shed for the many. Take and drink, in the remembrance of me.
Jesus went through all the towns and villages teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers, they're few. Ask the Lord of harvest, therefore, to send out the workers into his harvest field. And Jesus called his twelve disciples to him and gave them the authority to drive out impure spirits and heal every disease and th sickness. And these are the names of the twelve apostles. First, Simon, who's called Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Those twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go to proclaim this message, the kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse out those who have leprosy, drive out demons, and freely you have received, freely give. Do not get any gold or silver or copper to take with you in your belts, no bag for the journey or extra shirt or sandals or a staff, for the worker is worth his keep. Whatever town or village you enter, search there for some worthy person and stay at their house until you leave. As you enter the home, give it your greeting. If the home is deserving, let your peace rest upon it. If it is not, let your peace return back to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, leave that home or town and shake the dust off of your feet. Truly, I tell you, it will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and innocent as doves. Be on your guard. You'll be handed over to the local councils and you'll be flogged in the synagogues. On my account, you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and the Gentiles. But when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you'll be given what to say. For it will not be you speaking, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. Brother will betray brother to death, and a father his children, and the children will rebel against their parents and will have them put to death. You will be hated by everyone because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. When you're persecuted in one place, flee to another. Truly I tell you, you will not finish going through the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Then Jesus summoned his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and cure every disease and sickness. And these are the names of the twelve apostles. Wait a minute. Something happened there, didn't it? Something important, but it goes by really fast. You may not have even noticed it no matter how many times you've read that passage of Scripture. In the first sentence, what are they called? Disciples. Then what are they suddenly called? Apostles. What happened? Even if you caught the change, you may not have ever paid much attention. Disciples, apostles, it's one of those Bible words. What's the difference? They're just interchangeable names for the same 12 guys, aren't they? What's the big deal? All over the country at this time of year, there are young people, and not so young, making the same kind of transition. The papers these weeks are full of reports of commencement speeches and graduations, even if they're small or scattered out or even online like we've been doing church. Uh, we can look at the pictures in the past of young graduates tossing their caps in the air to celebrate their change in status. One minute, they're students. They're still being taught. They're still in training. Still learning the ropes and the rules, we might say. All the formulas, the logarithms, whatever uh, discipline they are in. Castles shifting from one side to the other, grinning for pictures with mom and dad and other proud family members. And now, suddenly, there's somebody else. Something else. No longer students, but graduates. Ready to go out in the world to practice what they've been learning for the past couple of years or few years. They're no longer disciples. Do we all know that disciples means student? It's from a Latin word, discipuli, which means student. And uh, it means you're learning your discipline. You're learning your craft, your trade, your profession. They are, in effect, apostles, people being sent out into the world to do what they've been disciplined or discipled to do. That's what apostle means, someone who is sent out. The passage from Matthew marks the moment when the followers gathered around Jesus graduated. When Jesus seems to have decided that they knew enough, they were formed enough, they were shaped enough to be sent out and to share the mission and ministry with Him. Unlike our contemporary graduates, it wasn't that they completed a nice, tidy course and got good grades, the required number of credit hours and tests and final papers. Discipleship isn't easily marked out and as measured as all that is. This was more a matter of Jesus deciding that he taught them about all that he could. It was up to them to learn it and to put it into practice, much like it is us. At least for the moment he taught them all he could. And he knew that the world out there needed their ministry. I'm sure if we would think back, it was great to sit around with Jesus in human form and to listen to Him teach and to walk with Him and talk with Him and break bread with Him and eat by the, the lakeside. What, what an amazing time they must have had there with Jesus, the teacher, right beside them. But Jesus knew that as good as that was for them, they were needed outside of that immediate area. For several chapters before this story, Jesus had been traveling around. He had been healing people. He had been teaching. Um, the crowds were building up. More and more people kept coming with their pain and their need and their troubles. Harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd, the Bible says. As Jesus describes them, he looks on them, he can see a great need and far more than he alone can reach. After all, when he's in human form, he was just one person in one place, kind of like we are. And so it is time to add some helpers, right? Helpers to send out laborers into the Lord's harvest. So Jesus called to him his closest followers, the ones who've been with him the longest, observed the most, been really close to him. And he passed on to them some of his power. He gave them the power to name and overcome evil, the power to reconcile, the power granted to him by the heavenly Father originally, the holy and living God. And he sent them out. He apostled them with these instructions. He said, as you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. And some uh, passages of the scriptures say the kingdom of heaven is at hand, meaning the same thing. He tells them to cure the sick, 
raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out the demons, tell them the good news that the kingdom of God is near. It is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you, he tells them. And so, off they went to do the Father's work as disciples became apostles. Now, we can ask ourselves, did they do it perfectly? No. No, not at all. The Gospels in the book of Acts tell us over and over again the ways that they missed the mark, dropped the ball, fell over their own feet, and generally they were the gang who couldn't shoot straight. They couldn't understand the parables. They didn't know what he meant when he predicted his own death. It had to be explained to him. They slept through his last agonizing hours. They deserted him as he faced judgment on the cross. They barely recognized him when he appeared to them as the risen Christ. And they hadn't a clue what to do when they saw him up in heaven. One of them even sold him to the enemy government for a briefcase of unmarked bills if it were in today's terms. And yet, yet, even though all of that happened, there's a church around the world today witnessing to every nation the good news of God in Christ. The sun never sets on the Christian hope, does it? We always have that hope, the faith that proclaims the good news. Even when we spent three months pretty much tethered to our homes, or maybe if you were essential going to work, finding new ways of buying groceries and searching for toilet paper and hand sanitizer, guess what? The faith of God kept going. I heard stories of it, as I mentioned earlier in this service, over and over, and how that warmed my heart to know that we didn't just shrivel back and say, well, we can't walk into the church every Sunday at 10 o'clock. What are we going to do? I guess I'll just sit here. No, you went out, and I know countless other church members from other churches around the world went out and continued to share the good news of Jesus Christ in many, many different ways. The sun never sets on the Christian hope and faith. Even in the darkest hour, the ocean depths of God's love cannot contain it all. All because the disciples, as imperfect as they were, answered the challenge to not just continue to be disciples, just to sit there and learn only, but to be apostles, to be sent out and to take what we've learned and to use it. If I paid for someone to go to the most prestigious college in America and to take one of the toughest disciplines, whatever that might be, I'm just coming up with this on the fly here, and told them I'll pay for four years for you to do that. And then when they finally graduated, let's say they did really well in that field. And then they went home and sat. Are they going to make any money? No. Are they going to make a difference in that field? No. They may have the cure for the coronavirus. They might have a cure for hunger around the world. But if they never use the knowledge that they had and that God gave them, it will never be shared with anyone. We've got at some point to not only continue to be disciples and learn, but we've got to also transition into being apostles and going out in the world and sharing the good news. Oh, I know you've probably always thought that title belonged to the first 12 guys. Only those were the apostles. When was the last time you spoke of yourself as an apostle, myself included? But if you've made those baptismal promises, you've taken vows as an apostle. You might even try it on for size. Say it to yourself when you get home. I, and state your name, I am an apostle of Jesus Christ. All too often we're tempted to treat our life as a church as if it were an end to itself. We're happy to get, gather together in the confines of the sanctuary and the comfort that we have in worship in our buildings and just let the communities be. We've been content to be disciples, safely gathered around the Lord, shutting out all of the world. To be an apostle, though, is to be a risk, a risk taker, to venture out, step outside our supportive community, and sometimes get caught in the crossfire by sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. I love our stained glass windows, and when I was over in Europe singing, I love seeing the stained glass windows there. I always have and I always will. But you know, the first time I ever walked into a church uh, that had just clear 
glass windows. As I sat and listened, I forgot what the service was for that time, but I believe it was a music service. But as I sat there and listened, I looked around and saw the clear windows. I thought, you know, there's kind of a statement being made there. It's not only are we in here worshiping, but I can still glance over and look outside and see the house across the street or see the child walking down the sidewalk. And I can tell that as soon as I leave here, I need to be out there being an apostle. Jesus saw the world breathing and wounded. He knew it was suffering. He felt it in his own bones and his own heart. Chances are you've seen the movie Mission Impossible. If you haven't seen it, you've probably seen the ads for it. You know the line, your mission, if you choose to accept it, is, and then they give you the mission. Well, good Christian people, as apostles of Christ, we're called to a mission impossible almost for us. But with God, all things are possible. We can't forget that. Like the first apostle, don't, apostles, don't forget we won't be perfect. We'll make mistakes. We'll miss opportunities. We'll go back on our word. We'll betray our Lord just like the original apostles, apostles did. But our Lord is endlessly forgiving and he keeps on forgiving us and then sends us back out into the world to help others. So our mission, should we choose to accept it, is to go out from this church today, a place that we haven't been for three months, and name evil and name injustice and work to change things, change all of the fear and the rage set against people. The kingdom of God, let them know that it has come near. And don't worry about how you're going to accomplish it, because the words and the ways are going to come to you, Christ said. He said, when it's time, you'll have those words to speak, because it'll be the Spirit of God moving through you. Amen? Let us pray, amen. Oh God, our Father, we thank you that you're a creator, God. We thank you you've made all things and have made them well. That you've given to us things to enjoy. For the beauty and the bounty of the earth, for the trees budding and the flowers blooming. We thank you, Father, who's made all things and all people. Forgive us if in pride and selfishness and anger we've misused any of your gifts. And have used that which for death was meant for life. And to this we say... Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for all those who are in need of a healing today, who are sick within our fellowship, those who have lost loved ones, and we're especially lifting up Hayes and Monty today as he's lost his nephew recently. I ask you to continue to be with them, all of those who are on our prayer list today. We lift up all those who we love and we've been physically distanced from, and some continue to be physically distanced from. Be with those who are not with us today from our fellowship. Be with the one who needs a bit of encouragement today or maybe a friend to talk to. Help us to always take time to take uh, care of others. And to this we say, Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for the needs of others, even the most basic needs that we take for granted. Health and food and clothing and shelter, safety and justice for your lives. Help us, Father, to live out your commandments of providing those things for others. And remembering in the scripture when it said when we do it to others, we're doing it just as we would do it unto you. Father, be with those who've lost jobs and income due to the pandemic. Help them to continue to look for jobs and to find jobs and to get back to work. We've been encouraged by some of those work numbers that have come out. And again, we ask that you keep our public safety and all of our health care workers and essential workers safe. And to this we say, Lord, hear our prayer. God, we bring the opportunity for peace and justice to this world, so look in mercy upon all the nations, but especially our nation today, as we've seen all of the unrest in our streets. We ask that those from all sides would have calm hearts and clear heads and discuss all the issues at hand. We pray for all of our leaders, for Donald, our president, our senators, our representatives in Congress. We pray for Ralph, our governor, Bradley, our mayor, and our town council members here in Denton also. To this we say, Lord, hear our prayer. Oh God, we pray for your church on earth. You've commanded that we be your voice and your hands around the world, so help us to do that. Help us to go out into the world today to love and serve others. And help us to be the church and the people that you've created us for. Remember today, especially Terry, who's our general minister and president of the Christian church. Bill, who's our regional minister. Pray for all of our deacons and deaconesses and our elders here at First Church and all of our members and friends who go out and carry forth your joyful word. To this we say, Lord, hear our prayer. And even now in all the different places that we are in all our different languages, we join our voices with the voice of Christ who taught us to pray, saying when we didn't even know how, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn that I'll sing is on number 700, O Day of God, Draw Nigh. Very good words to this old thing. Thank you for being here again today. Mm -hmm.